So in 2015, I was dying. I had spent the five years previous, from 2010 to 2015, watch my kidney function numbers go down and down and down, going from about 100% function down every year to 12% function in the end. I was dying. I had a disease called polycystic kidney disease in which your kidney, it's basically a bunch of little filters. Those little filters decide they don't want to be filters anymore. They want to be balloons and they swell up. And your kidneys, which weigh about a pound put together, mine weighed about 10 pounds by the end. 10 times bigger <laughs> and about 10% as efficient. This is, a, this is a heavy period. This is a difficult time in my life. And I want to talk about the process of going downhill, getting a transplant that saved my life, and then coming back from being physically quite weak. And the, it was an up and down journey. And the reason I want to talk about this is not really to boast, but it's to give hope to people who are going through a difficult time. Maybe people are going through a transplant, or maybe they're just going through something really difficult medically or with their lives, and it doesn't really look like there's a way out. But if you persevere, and if you keep on going, if you keep on looking for an answer, I can't guarantee you a good outcome. I can't guarantee that if you follow the right steps for getting out of Mount, and you're on the bottom of Mount, that you're gonna get out. But I can promise you that if you don't try to get out, if you don't try and keep on going, then you're gonna fail. So I'm hoping to give hope to people who are in a difficult spot. And I'm also gonna try and bribe you towards the end of this to go and sign your donor cards, to go and sign up to be an organ donor. And if you've already, for the small, small percentage of people who are listening to this, if you've already been a donor of some sort, I'm gonna reward you. So that'll come at the end. As I was saying, I had polycystic kidney disease. It's a genetic condition. I inherited it from my mom. About 50% of my mom's children had it, 50% didn't. And it progresses at a different speed. Some people it goes really fast. My mom made it to 70 before she died of a different thing. I, as it turns out, I wasn't so lucky. It progressed much faster than me. And the way I found out about it was strange. You could make an argument that jujitsu helped save my life yet again. I had peed blood after hard training sessions before, especially sparring, yes, MMA sparring, kickboxing sparring. I'd come home once in a while, I'd pee blood, and this seemed semi-normal, right? You hear about this. You hear about guys playing rugby, about guys playing football, about boxers peeing blood. So this seemed normal to me. Didn't do it every time. But one day I came home from a jiu-jitsu session where there had been no throwing. There'd been none of that impact. There'd been no striking. It had just been jiu-jitsu. And there was blood in the pee. And this didn't seem normal. Where was the mechanism? Why would this be happening? This is in about 2010. So I went and saw my doctor and I went and got the blood work and I went and got the urinalysis and I went and got an ultrasound and it showed that I had this condition. My mom was the ultimate stoic. She wouldn't tell you that her arm had been amputated if it had been cut off with a chainsaw earlier that day. You would have had to find it out on your own. She never really talked about this. She knew she had it, never really talked about it. We talked about it after that point, but not before. So it gradually knocks out the kidney function. And when you go from 100% function to 50% function, you feel pretty good. You don't really feel any different. You feel a bit anxious and you start trying different things. In my case, I tried lots of things to slow down the progression. I went to a full vegan diet. So no meat, no animal products, nothing but vegetables, Maybe it slowed it down, maybe it didn't, hard to tell. It's a data point of one, right? If we had a thousand people all trying a vegan diet, maybe it would slow it down for half of them. Didn't slow it down for me. As we started progressing from 50% down to 40%, it was more and more frequent that I would go to my nephrologist, my kidney doctor, and say, hey, doc, I found this study in a scientific journal of something they did to rats, right? And they gave rats niacin. And 
it slowed down the progression of this disease. And my kidney doctor would say stuff like, Stefan, remember this is with rats. This isn't with human beings. Rats are different from human beings. Remember this is a small study. And I would say something like, yeah, I know, but I'm dying here. So I'm going to give it a try. And he would say, well, if you're going to give that a try, then make sure to do this, make sure to do that. And for, you know, for example, I was taking niacin. Another thing I tried is hugely increasing my water intake. I was drinking up to five liters a day, which can be problematic because that can flush out all your electrolytes. So at the same time as you're doing that, you better be monitoring your electrolytes. So I was monitoring my electrolytes. I was trying to do everything right. I was trying to talk to my kidney doctor. He was generally supportive of me trying these things, but nothing worked. It kept on getting worse. So you're watching go 50% to 40%, 40% down to 30%, still feeling all right. 30% down to about 25%. Now you begin feeling it. Now you're just, you know, you're just more tired. You're just not recovering from workouts. Because I was still working out during this time, still doing jiu-jitsu, still doing conditioning, still doing weightlifting still trying to stay active. Because I knew that whatever would be coming down the pipe, I wanted to be in as good a shape as possible. Round about this time, my doctor starts asking me difficult questions. You know what's a difficult question? Stefan, do you know anyone who can be a kidney donor? That's a tough one. I would, and I still would, a thousand times rather give somebody a kidney than ask someone for a kidney. I had far, far, far rather be the one that gives that gift rather than going to someone, hey, do you mind if we cut out an essential part of your body? So I put that off. I bravely put that off. And you, you'll see I was a total pussy about asking for a kidney. 25% down to 20%. Now we're getting fatigued. Now we're really beginning to get fatigued. But, you know, maybe it'll turn around. Maybe it'll stabilize at 20%. Maybe... This will stabilize for long enough for there to be nano kidneys. Maybe they'll be able to grow a kidney in a petri dish. Maybe they'll be able to grow a kidney in a, in a jar. Then I won't have to ask anyone. Maybe a genetic solution will come along. Maybe somebody will develop something in China where they can inject you with a you know, CRISPR-based technology. It'll come in and it'll excise out that portion of DNA. It'll put in the right portion of DNA and that kidney will magically come back. Maybe it will. We've been waiting for this. It's coming in the next 10 years for the last 20 years. <laughs> it's not here yet. It's not here. It'll be here someday. But it wasn't coming fast enough to save me. 20% down to 15%. Foolishly, I was still at work. I'm a firefighter. This is the point where I started telling people about it. And I, I didn't try and keep it a secret at work. The same day that I went and told the chiefs, <laughs> it's the same day I put a post on our Facebook group saying, hey, Here's what's going on with me. Feel free to ask me any questions. I'm going to need a transplant someday. I also went and asked my brother. That was tough. You know how I did it? Super bravely. I sent him a text. You know, <laughs> he had mentioned earlier that, hey, if you ever need a kidney, uh, you know, I'll give you one. This is as I told him as I was going downhill. So when I actually had to say, hey, can you go and do these tests, these tests? I was so nervous and so apprehensive about it that I couldn't actually pick up the phone to make the call. I bravely sent a text. Have you heard about breaking up with people by text? Well, I did the opposite. I begged for my life by text. Fortunately, he said yes. And then also, unexpectedly, a bunch of guys in the fire department went and got tested. They, they signed up as donors. And if, if I'm gonna give you a kidney, you don't want my kidney, but if I'm gonna give you a kidney, it's not just, here's a kidney. I gotta go and get a whole bunch of tests done to make sure that we're compatible. It's not just blood type, it's blood type. There's a whole bunch of other proteins. There's a whole bunch of other considerations because you can get a good kidney or you can get a bad kidney. You can get one that'll be rejected quickly, one that won't work in you. There's a whole series of tests. So I'm forever grateful to the guys who, at the fire department who went and also got tested, also a cop. So I'm also forever grateful to him. Interestingly, many of them were jiu-jitsu training partners. Around about this time, I started having other crazy side effects from the failing kidneys. Your kidneys filter your blood. They get rid of protein metabolites. 
That's important. They also do lots of other things. They maintain your electrolyte balance, your potassium and your sodium and your magnesium. And mine was going completely out of whack. Uh, my ankles started to swell up. It looked like I had congestive heart failure just from the accumulation of fluids there. My blood pressure started to go up, 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 and it started being a real challenge to find the various, the right blood pressure control medications to stop my blood pressure from going so high <laughs> for me to have a stroke before I had my transplant. The uh, fatigue kept on building. Also, your kidneys do things like produce erythropoietin which then stimulates hemoglobin production and red blood cell production. So my red blood cells started to tank. And having had low red blood cells a few times, it feels like you're walking around at 8,000 meters. You're walking around and, you know, it, it's really tiring. So finally, down about 15% kidney function, I booked off of work. I told work, I've got to go. And they were actually, I was so grateful there because... As I went through the whole process, I ran into lots of other people going through transplants and they were, their huge concern was how the hell am I gonna pay the mortgage? How am I gonna feed my family? Fortunately, and I'm forever grateful, I'm forever grateful for a lot of things. This is one of the things I'm forever grateful for. Fire department basically said, that's terrible. Take as much time off as you need. Don't worry, your salary is gonna keep on coming in. That just took care of all that. Of course, with a grapple arts component, running grapple arts and you know the, the YouTube channel and all that, I had known that it was likely that I was going to be out of commission for a while. So I had stockpiled a whole bunch of footage. I'd filmed a whole bunch of footage that I could continue to trickle feed out during the surgery and my hopeful recovery so that that at least would have some continuity. And that was a really smart thing I did, but the support I got from the fire department was invaluable. There were other guys... They like a month post-surgery and they're talking about going back to work to drive dump truck. And I remember how I felt a month post-surgery. Man, I could walk, barely. You know, I could do some push-ups, but in terms of you know, feeling anywhere near normal, no, that took a lot longer. And I'll talk about the whole recovery component later. So, you know, it seems petty, it seems superficial, but people going through major medical procedures uh, I'd known people going through cancer. And yeah, they were worried about surviving cancer. But they were also worried about going bankrupt while surviving cancer. You know, it's enough to fight cancer without worrying about, you know, how is my GoFundMe campaign doing to, uh, to fund me through this? Fortunately, I live in Canada. So <laughs> I'm going to insert plug for, quote, socialized medicine here. Thank God for the socialized medicine program that we have here. That entire time, you know what it cost me? I had to pay for a few of my antibiotics at a heavily reduced rate. I had to pay for parking at the hospital, which was ruinous because they know they've got you over a barrel. So yeah, I had to pay like $20, $25 a day for parking for pretty much daily for months. You know what? That beats going into, uh, into debt for millions of dollars <laughs> to pay for a transplant. So. Don't ever let anybody tell you, oh, that's socialized medicine in Canada. They have to wait for years. No, I got all the treatment I needed when I needed it. So there, that's the public service announcement component of this podcast rant. Hopefully I've not lost too many of you. So we're getting closer and closer to the surgery day. My brother is going through test after test after test. It's not just a bunch of physical tests and blood tests and uh, protein compatibility tests and genetic tests. They're also testing him psychologically. They want to make sure I'm not putting pressure on him, you know, or bribing him or threatening him and that I'm not taking advantage of somebody who's mentally ill. So he's going through all this testing. And finally, we get to the day. I got transplanted June 8th. I went into the hospital June 7th. I've got a thing. I find it really hard to sleep when there's noise. It needs to be dark, which is never dark in a hospital. It needs to be quiet. Never quiet in a hospital. I had gone, I had conversations with them saying, look, I'll pay for a private room. I'll, what do I need to do to get a private room? Don't worry, we can't guarantee you a private room. You'll probably have a private room. If you have a private room, you pay for it, we'll sort that out. It's like, awesome. So I go in on the evening, the afternoon of June 7th. 
you settle in, you know, you set everything up, you've got your books to read. I brought a whole bunch of books to read, podcasts to listen to. I'm just trying to relax. I'm not that stressed out. Like I said, the analogy that I use for this whole thing is you're stuck on the bottom of a mount. Is it going to work to get out? Is it not going to work to get out? Don't know. But you know what's not going to help? is panicking about whether you're going to get out or not. You know what the steps are. I knew what the steps were at that point. Most of them were out of my control. It's like the Alcoholics Anonymous prayer, right? Give me the strength to change the things I can, the serenity to accept the things I cannot, and the wisdom to know the difference. I had the wisdom at this point to know this is all in the doctor's hands, really. Uh, I've got a funny story about uh, my brother trying to take it out of my doctor's hands, but I'll save that for later. So I go into the hospital room, and there's two beds, but I'm the only one there. I'm like, yes, I lucked out. I lucked out. I'm sitting there, and you know they, they bring some... Forget if I was allowed to eat. I don't think I was allowed to eat because the transplant was going to be sometime the next morning. And now it's getting about 8 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden they wheel someone in. They wheel in this old guy, this old East Indian guy. And he's kind of the patriarch of his family, and I don't know if you <laughs> know that many East Indian patriarchs. They don't go to the hospital by themselves. They don't go to the hospital with one other person. They go to the hospital with their whole family and their whole extended family. So there's this old guy in the other half of the room. He's got his wife. He's got a sister. He's got his sister's sister. He's got his kids. He's got his... There's like 20 people sitting there. They're all around him. He's also in for a transplant. I don't know what kind of transplant. And they're doing their best to stay quiet, but you just can't have 20 people in a room all night long. Not quite a death watch, a pre-transplant watch, guarding their patriarch. <laughs> And that made for an incredibly crappy night's sleep. I actually think I would have gotten to sleep if, uh, if it hadn't been for him. Little did I know that I wasn't going to get much sleep the coming week after. In the morning, they wheel him off at some point early in the morning, and I never see him again. Presumably, that was to have his procedure. And at about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, the nurses come get me. They do one last final check. They take my blood pressure. They take some blood. They do this. They do that. Um... They write on my belly so that they, uh, they don't accidentally take out my liver. I go down. I have to get into one of those surgical gowns, put on the, the hat, which is always funny, seeing as I had a shaved head. For some reason, I didn't want the hair of my eyebrows to fall on the incision site. Go in, meet with my doctor one last time. He's a pretty cool guy. He had just finished taking the kidney out of my brother. As it turns out, my brother was quite insistent that like, you know, when you're taking my kidney out, can you make sure that you're playing some calm, restful music? Yeah, I don't want to like have any like thrash metal playing while he's unconscious. And in my mind, I'm going, man, whatever the surgeon needs to be in the right state to take your kidney out properly. It's about the surgeon. It's not about you. Anyhow, because he was doing me a favor and doing the surgeon a favor and doing the hospital a favor. They had to scramble at the last minute to find a speaker and an iPod to find some like calm, restful Anya or some kind of calm music to play while they're slicing them open. I talk with my surgeon. I'm, uh, you know, saying, if you can, you know, please don't, uh, um, you know, make the incision as small as possible so that I can recover as fast as possible. He like basically pats me on the head and you like, yeah, sure, I'm going to do that. He's going to do whatever he wants. You know, so I'm not immune from asking, having silly requests. I get wheeled into the operating room. There's you know, 10 people there. Sitting off on the corner is a table. There's this red nylon bag, basically like a, a foldable lunch cooler that you might take for a picnic. And sitting in there, <laughs> I've got a photo of it. I'll put it up in the video form of this podcast, is my brother's kidney. It's right in this bag. They've cut it out of him a few hours earlier, and now it's my turn. They do the whole, like, you know, go through the assessment, they lie you down, they put the mask on you, they say, okay, count back from 100. And I've had surgeries before, so it's always a game to see how long you can last. Man, I don't think I ever make it past uh, 93. You know, you're 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, and you're right. Like, it's amazing how fast. You go out, don't remember anything. Wake up later. In the recovery room, my ex-wife is there. She's brought my kids. My kids are looking at me. 
They're trying not to show it. I'm just yellow. Just yellow. From the, uh, basically, as they take the kidney out, put the kidney in, your body develops a whole bunch of toxins. Those toxins go into the blood. It's like you've got liver failure. It's like you've got liver failure. I feel terrible. All right, you, when you're coming up from general anesthetic, it feels like you're stuck in a pit of molasses and you're trying to claw your way to the top of it and you're, you're totally woozy. Throat is so unbelievably dry. That is my main memory from that period. How much my throat hurt. It's because they don't want you drinking water. They just replumbed your entire system, essentially from producing urine. They don't want to you know, have you pouring tons of water down there while these blood vessels are still not attached. Um, basically, when they put a kidney in, it's a pretty easy transplant because all you have to do is connect the blood vessel going in, they take the kidney, they connect the blood vessel going into the kidney, the main one, to the blood vessel leaving the kidney, the main one, there's a few other ones that get cut, get cauterized, and then the, the uh, vessel that brings urine from your kidney to your bladder. So they've got to connect three things. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where they put it in the body in case we ever meet in Mortal Kombat. You'll know where to strike me. But know that they don't leave it in the original place. It's kind of cool. They put it in the pelvis. They put it in the crook of the pelvis. Don't hit me there. Uh, so they replumb your entire body. I've got some cool ass scars. You know, basically they fillet you and they splay you open. They plumb this in. For me, they left the two kidneys in originally. And those created a lot of trouble later. But they left them in. So quite a distended belly. Because now they've taken, you know, you've got your two 10 pound kidneys and they've jammed additional stuff in there and you've got inflammation. Now you're waking up and your throat is so sore. I'm begging for water. They're giving me like, here's a little ice chip. You can suck on this ice chip. Please, water. Here's another little ice chip. And that went on for hours and hours and hours till I got out of intensive care. I'm glad I saw my kids. It was too bad I scared the crap out of them. But uh, it all worked out for the best. They still have a father. So eventually you make it back up onto the ward. Now they're checking your blood. They're, they're coming drawing blood every few hours. They're coming in on you all the time. And I found my next roommate. Of course, I didn't have my own room. I had Larry the liver guy. Now, I had a kidney transplant, and when your kidney fails, you still stay sane. You get tired, but you stay sane. When your liver fails, ammonia builds up in your blood, and you go insane. Like, quite literally, not joking, insane. So Larry the liver guy had just had a kidney, uh, a liver transplant, and he's in the same room. We had the transplant, same day. His system is soaked with ammonia. He's out of his mind. He's singing. He's screaming. He's begging. He's pleading. Mostly at night. At night, he goes completely nuts. By day, he tells me his whole life story. Again, and again, and again, and again. I heard Larry the Liver Guy's story. We roomed there for four days because it took me five days. I was in the hospital for five nights probably 25 times, right from where he was born to how his liver failed to his, the names of his dogs to where he lives now, again and again and again. I ran into Larry the liver guy six months later. I was going into the transplant clinic where they do the follow-up, and this little guy is sitting there quietly reading a book, and I look over and go, hey, Larry, how's it going? And he looks at me and goes, I'm sorry, I have no idea who you are. I'm like, I was your roommate right when you had your transplant. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Apparently he'd been told what a pain in the ass he was. <laughs> and complete personality shift, right? It's another amazing example of how chemistry determines personality. I had been ready to murder him. I already sleep badly enough in a hospital setting with people coming to poke you and prod you and see if you're awake, see if you're still alive, and then there's noises, and the machine that goes ping, and there's lights, and then there's Larry the liver guy deciding to imitate a canary and chirp for an hour. Six months later, totally normal, totally quiet, sweetheart of a human being. Chemistry can determine personality. 
So people have often asked about whether I was scared during this whole procedure. Yes and no. I think I was pretty stoic about the idea of dying. I mean, dying is so far out of your control, it's almost, back when I was whitewater paddling, there was a guy I used to paddle with, and he got really badly injured in a waterfall. And he said afterwards he'd always been at ease with the idea of dying, living or dying. He hadn't been ready to lead a life after being really severely injured. And I think that's really ultimately what I was scared of. I was scared of, you know, losing the kidney. I was scared of having to go on dialysis, having to go on a wait list, live in this limbo-like existence for years and years and years, maybe get back just enough function to not die, but then not lead a quality life. You know, there's a point there of how much quality of life do you need to make life worthwhile? I was also scared of dying and leaving my children without a father. That was a big concern. So those things were ever on my mind and this idea to get back to full form or at least some semblance of full form and be able to do the things that I loved doing that I had been able to do less and less of as I declined, that's really what kept me going. Those are my biggest fears. It was not dying, but living half a life afterwards. Let me go through the actual recovery process and some of the milestones because maybe somebody watching this is going to go through the same process or a similar process. They want to know how fast you can get back to being a semi-normal human being. The answer there is about four to five months, but that was a lot of work. So the transplant was June 8th. I was told not to lift more than five or 10 pounds for six to 12 weeks. So don't lift more than five or 10 pounds for three to four months, which seemed a bit ridiculous to me, honestly. Like, sure, you don't wanna go strain yourself and tear sutures that have just formed or rip connective tissue, but I already was like, unless something goes terribly, terribly wrong, I can be lifting more than five to 10 months. I mean, think your body weight. Your body, 200 pounds for easy math, if you sit up from a chair, you're already lifting 100 pounds at least, maybe 150 pounds. I'm like, another 10 pounds, not gonna make a difference. However, at first, lifting five or 10 pounds was almost this far off vision of maybe one day I'll be able to do, you know, lift a weight. Because the day one, you come out of surgery, you're done. You're completely put a fork in it, done. You're exhausted. I did walk the next day, but honestly, that was like, you got catheters in you, you've got um, these giant lines going into your neck that's dripping medication directly into your heart. You feel like you've gone 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. It was all I could do to like walk down and sort of halfway around the hallway of the hospital and then walk back. I did that a couple of times. In my mind, I had this idea that walking was gonna be the cure. Walking was gonna be the universal therapy for getting better from this. So that was really the emphasis. I got home five days later, and for the rest of June, I was just focused on doing walks. And now the walks initially were pathetic. We're talking walking around the block and having to stop two or three times and almost like, oh my God, thank God there's a park bench there because I need to sit down for 20 minutes so I can continue this. But gradually, the distances started getting longer. Gradually, the brakes started getting slower and gradually my, my hemoglobin started climbing. Right? It's a surgery. You're going to lose a lot of blood. There's also, because they're screwing around with the kidneys, you're, the erythropoietin that's being delivered to your system, telling you to create more hemoglobin, telling you to create more red blood cells, that system's all screwed up. My hemoglobin dropped through the floor and then gradually started climbing. Another difficult part of this is even if you get out of the hospital, you gotta go in daily to the clinic. Now the clinic, you get there at like six in the morning. Why do you get there at six o'clock in the morning? Because you're standing in line to be first to be in through the doors when the doors open. That then allows you to have blood drawn. You go get blood drawn. Now you go to another part of the hospital where you wait one, two, or three hours to see the nurses, the doctors, to have them adjust your medication based on your blood work, which has just come in. And they're just dosing you with heavy doses of anti-rejection drugs. Because initially, your system's going, holy crap, there's like a fist-sized parasite in my body, right? There's a kidney. But it, your system doesn't know. Is it some kind of 
giant worm? Is it some kind of animal that's burrowed into you? Is it some giant bacterial infection? It doesn't know. It wants to attack it with everything that it has. So you need to take all these drugs to suppress your immune, your immune system. And the earlier it is in transplant, the heavier they nuke you. And then they gradually begin to back off and they gradually begin to give you less and less drugs. But initially, you're going in every single day to get measured, to have your blood drawn, to have your medications adjusted, because your system's just in total chaos. Your system, you know, the electrolytes are still completely out of whack as your kidney function starts coming back. It's a drag. And now you're getting up super early. You're getting up crazy early in the morning for how you feel, limping to the hospital, waiting there for three hours. Thank God for the computer. I did a lot of work on grapple arts during that period. True, it was in slow motion, but if you're there for a sufficient number of hours working in slow motion, you actually get work done. By uh, mid-June, by late June, June 29th, so that would be 21 days after the surgery, I did manage a 10 kilometer walk, completely level, lots of breaks, uh, and that took two and a half hours. So two or three weeks later, I'm starting to feel like I can actually hike. And what I did at that point, I said, if I continue to improve at this rate, by later in the year, I should actually be semi-functional. I should be training again. I should be weightlifting again. And I set for myself as a goal to get back on the mats, yes, but also to do this 50 kilometer, 30 mile hike in the mountains near here with a ton of up and down. I think it's five kilometers of up and five kilometers of down. So that's called a knee knacker. It's run as an ultra marathon race. I wasn't gonna run it, but I wanted to hike it. So I set the date in December, when incidentally it'd be covered in snow, and I did get there. It was a lot, a lot of training, a lot of hiking, a lot of walking. But like I said, walking was my rehab. I did start doing light weights, you know, in July. I mean, we're talking, 10 pound weights, we're talking air, you know, body weight squats, we're talking things that didn't affect the core, because I didn't, I got full of scar tissue, full of scars, I didn't want to tear that area up. My uh, first weights with squats were a month and a half later, it was 135 pound squats on a barbell, so that was on July 24th, like I said, month and a half, so that's a pretty good indication that things are getting better. And I started doing jiu-jitsu super lightly about a month and a half later in that same time. My first roll back, my first roll after having this transplant, obviously got to go super light. I remember my sparring partner. She was a 130 pound Asian woman who was five months pregnant. A five month pregnant Asian woman, almost half my weight. We're both super crazy invested in not getting injured. Obviously, she doesn't want to hurt her baby for some weird reason, and I don't want to tear my stitches from bow to stern or dis, you know, displace this kidney that's been put inside me. So we were just rolling, making positions. It was almost like you know, live action role play. I'm gonna do this, at which point I will do this, and I will do this. But it was time on the mat. It was time on the mat, and for the next months, I didn't go hard at all. I just went with people that I knew, and tiny Asian women, to make sure that nothing crazy would happen. And as I kept on changing my medications, and, and I started feeling better and better and better. And having that goal to work towards, that 50 kilometer death march, was really useful. Doing that really, I mean, it was super long. It was the middle of winter. There was snow for half of it. There was rain for the other half. It took something like 18 hours, started at 6 in the morning, finished close to midnight. It was fantastic. It's really hard, but it's fantastic. And when I finished that, I was kind of like, motherfuckers, I'm back. You know, I, I'm not dead. Not dead yet. Unfortunately, I wasn't quite done with surgical procedures. I still had those two original kidneys inside me. So instead of two sort of fist-sized kidneys, I had two rugby-sized, rugby ball sized kidneys in there that were full of these cysts, hence polycystic kidney disease. They kept on breaking. And every time they broke, I'd get an infection. Usually that infection would be in the, in, they'd break into the bladder side. So I'd instantly end up with a urinary tract infection and a fever. Um, so we made the, we, I talked to my doctor, my surgeon, and we agreed that we should probably remove them. Most of the time they leave the old stuff in there, 
This time they thought, no, it should come out because it was giving me probably every month, month and a half, I was getting like TikTok, getting a major UTI. So I was scheduled for surgery in early January. So I was like, okay, there's going to be a big surgery. I'm feeling pretty good. I should go hit the weights because I'm not going to be able to lift the weights much for, uh, for the next couple of weeks. So I want to go in there with a big dose of testosterone, get a big surge of growth hormone, and then I'll be able to, you know, rest up for a couple of weeks. So I went and I went heavy with squats, heavy back squats, heavy front squats. Felt pretty good. Felt pretty good. Except a couple hours later, I started coming down with a fever again. And I was taking care of my kids and I'm wearing a parka in the house with the heat jacked, lying on the floor in front of a hot air vent, trying to get cold, trying to get warm because I was so cold. Just shivering, shivering. So I was like, I got to go to the emergency. I drove the kids to my ex's place to, so they're taken care of. I shouldn't have been driving. I drove. Drove myself to the hospital. One block away, very, very slight incline from where I was parked to the emergency. Walking up that incline, was like climbing bloody Mount Everest. It was so difficult. And as soon as I got in there, I went from freezing cold, wearing a sweater and a parka, to just drenched in sweat. Just take the parka off, I'm wearing a t-shirt, it's just covered in sweat. And I was going through these crazy hot and cold oscillations. And what it was, instead of like before, when the old bacteria infested cysts had broken into the bladder side, this time that infected cyst had broken into the blood side. And bacteria in the blood is called sepsis. And it's really bad stuff. It's really, really not a good situation. And the trouble is, to deal with this ongoing kid series of kidney infections, I'd been on antibiotics for months, meaning the stuff I had now was resistant to all the most powerful antibiotics. So I'm in the hospital. It took them a while to sort it out. Eventually, they went to the special vault they keep at the hospital where they keep the few remaining antibiotics that are effective against antibiotic-resistant bacteria. They only open this vault and they've got someone like me who's got an infection that's resistant to everything else and gave me a shot. I'm there just oscillating from super hot and sweating to shivering and cold to super hot and sweating to like, oh my God, there aren't enough blankets in the world to keep me warm. And after a couple hours of getting that um, IV injection of that super antibiotic, I started feeling better. And that was antibiotics, going to the hospital every single day, twice a day actually, for an antibiotic drip. That was a lot of fun. And eventually, yeah, that surgery to remove those kidneys had to be canceled because of that, because they can't operate on me when I'm in sepsis. It got rescheduled for a little bit later. I had that done. That was a painful surgery. They basically went in, they told me at the beginning they were gonna go endoscopically, endoscopically, which means in theory that they're not gonna go and split you open they're going to just use little tools to, uh, to operate in. Yeah, bullshit. They put a cut into me. It was only about that long. But then there's also four stab wounds. One, two, three, four. One where they stick a light in. One where they stick a camera in. One where they stick a stick in to like move organs out of the way. Another place where they put a stick in to move internal organs around. And, and then they, I guess they used one of the top holes because the kidneys had actually glued on to the liver. So they had to like scrape off the old kidneys from where they attached onto the liver. Tons of bleeding on the inside. So yeah, endoscopically means one pretty giant cut and then four other stab wounds uh, in the four quadrants of the belly and an intense amount of pain. Just a really, really intense amount of pain for a few days. It took like two days of lying there. Um, I didn't want to take... Uh, Tylenols, Tylenol 3s. I didn't want to take opiates. Took them for the first day, stopped taking them the second. And then by the day three, I was out of there. They said that I was the fastest guy to ever get out of the hospital for a double kidney removal. As I told a friend of mine who lost a kidney to cancer, any pussy can lose one kidney. It takes a real man to lose two kidneys and still keep on going. Of course, I had three to start with. So the recovery from that was pretty fast. And, uh, 
despite the incredible initial pain. And um, once again, because you lose so much blood during surgery, my hemoglobin plummeted, I felt like the walking dead, then gradually, 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 especially the more exercise I did, feeling like crap, but doing it anyway, trying to eat well, trying to eat healthy, trying to stay hydrated, trying to make sure I'm getting nutrients. Gradually, those hemoglobin numbers started climbing up and up and up. And by July of that year, I did a second death march. So that was kind of my, <laughs> go get a massive body rearranging surgery. And six months later, see if you can do a 50 kilometer or 30 mile hike in the mountains, get another massive surgery. Try and do another 50 mile hike, 50 kilometer hike in the mountains, six months later. Having that end goal in mind really helped focus the training. Getting back on the mats as soon as you could with somebody sane really helped focus the training required to get better. It's just a question of doing as much as you can. Man, I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't watch a lot of TV. During those two recovery times, I went and ordered Netflix. I watched a lot of TV. Most of the TV series that I've watched in the past 10 years were during those two weeks after the first surgery and the two weeks after the second surgery. Because it'd be all I can do initially to get up, walk to the kitchen, make some chicken noodle soup from the package, because that's all I could eat, make it, eat it, and then go back to bed. That would be my exercise for the morning. Afternoon, I guess I gotta eat something again. Let me see if I can get enough energy to go and eat something and then collapse back into bed. Like I said, the second surgery was a bit faster. My goal after the second surgery was to do a 10 kilometer walk one week after getting out of hospital. That was 10 days after the surgery. And it was a 10 kilometer loop, again, completely flat. And um, that was a mistake. So I'm heading off, I'm walking, I'm feeling all right. I'm, I know I'm walking slow. I used to run this loop, now I'm just trundling along. And all of a sudden, like three little Asian ladies who are like 80 years old each pass me. I'm like, okay, that's tough on the ego, but I'm gonna keep on going. And then uh, after about three kilometers, I'm like, I need to take a break. And by four kilometers, I'm like, I really need to take a break. And so I sit down and like recover for a while. By five kilometers, I'm like, I'm gonna pass out. I'm gonna be lying here on the ground. People are gonna assume I'm drunk. I'm gonna end up in the drunk tank, I'm gonna die. I better leave. So I took a taxi um, and you know, managed to hike out, get a taxi. I did complete it two weeks later, that same 10 kilometer loop. Um, that was a bit more of a success. I completed it in not a terrible, terrible time. Got to the finish point, went to the bathroom, peed blood all over the urinal, and next day came down with a UTI. So there was definitely an element of overdoing it in all of this, but fortunately there was modern medicine, fortunately there were antibiotics, and yeah, I was lifting more than five to 10 pounds, a lot faster than the recommended, uh, was it nine to 12 weeks. It's funny how helpless you feel after a big surgery like that. I mean, for one thing, your core has been compromised. Everything that you do with your upper body, assuming that you're standing, is connected to your lower body by your core. Whether you throw a punch, whether you do an arm bar, whether you're walking fast, you need your core. So now that's been cut, maybe that's been stapled, stitched, or glued back together, but your abdomen is still going, ah, uh -uh, not having any of this stuff. And as a result, you're walking like an 80 year old man. So at the time, I was doing these daily walks, right? Like daily hobbles around the block. And I was coming around, and my neighbors had moved out months ago and we were waiting for new guys to move in. And so I'm walking by and they've got a garage with a gate that opens into the garage parking area or the parkade area. And I see the gates open. I'm like, oh, I wonder if my neighbors have moved in. I guess I should say hello. Besides, it would be a good break here because I am you know, still have another 50 feet to go to go home and I could use a break at this point. So I, I open the gate and I look in, but I don't think these are my new neighbors. One guy's passed out on the ground and the other guy is there with a spoon and a lighter heating his heroin. And he looks up at me and goes, dude, don't worry, we're not bad guys. And I'm thinking to myself, it doesn't matter. You can be the worst guys in the world and there's nothing I could do. If I had a stick, I would be whacking you like this, just with my elbow, because I wouldn't be able to turn my body. If you guys rushed me, I'd be fucked. There's nothing I could do. The upper part of my body doesn't connect the lower part of my body. 
And that's not a common occurrence where I live, but that was an occurrence that day. Of course it had to happen then. You know, another day, in that same period of time, I was finally driving. I was driving to a store that I uh, shop at, a natural food store. And a guy comes running out of there, and he's got, you know, some bags of chips and stuff. And the owner comes out, who I know, and he's like, hey, you, stop! And the guy's running away, runs across the street, and then just starts strolling up the street, because he knows the owner's not going to chase him across the street. And I'm like, there's nothing I can do. I guess I could take my car and run him over, which would probably end, me in, would end up with me in jail. Stand your ground law or no stand your ground law. I don't think there's like a stand your sidewalk law. So, again, there's nothing you can do in a feeling of complete helplessness. Like it's, hmm, that's interesting, but that guy's going to get away and now he's walking and I can see him walking away. And yes, I know intervening in situations like that is dangerous. But the reality is, before that operation or today, I probably would. I wouldn't be able to help myself. I've intervened like that a fair number of times in the past, and it's worked out well. I haven't been stabbed yet, and I probably would have done it again. But in that day, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And the feeling of frustration that you have from complete lack of any kind of combative ability, any ability to defend yourself, protect other people, <laughs> protect the rule of law, that's really frustrating. So a huge goal of mine this entire time was to get back on the mats, back to swinging sticks, back to doing martial arts. Been doing martial arts since I was 12. It's such a large part of my life, I can't imagine not having it in my life in some way, shape, or form. And I didn't want to not be able to do it. But the other half of that is, is that essentially a lifetime of doing martial arts, I think prepared me really well for this experience. What do we do in martial arts? We put ourselves into difficult situations on purpose. Hey, this round, we're gonna start on the bottom of mount. Okay, guys on top try and submit, guys on bottom try and get out. Or, okay, we're gonna spar, and you end up facing some guy who's 50 pounds heavier than you and 20 years younger than you, and you're like, oh, this is gonna be interesting. We put ourselves in difficult situations on purpose all the time. And the goal is to use your skills, the goal is to survive, maybe win, use your skills, and stay calm and rational, right? You don't, <laughs> breaking down and sobbing on the bottom of mount probably isn't gonna get you out of mount. Having a panic attack and, you know, being in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in the boxing ring isn't gonna help you win that boxing match, right? We progressively expose ourselves to greater and greater stress. I'm not saying that if you go start martial arts, that in your first class, you should go into full bore sparring with the biggest, baddest guy in the room. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if your baseline is zero and you've never done anything competitive or combative in your life, based on that baseline, the first step might be to pretend like you're punching somebody in the head. The first step might be to pretend like you're choking somebody out. Then the next step of pushing your comfort envelope might be to try it against resistance. Okay, guys, we're gonna spar. We're just gonna use the jab, go light. That might be blowing your mind already if you've never trained martial arts. It, because it's pushing your comfort ability, your comfort level, and it's training your ability to remain calm, stoic, and sanguine under those circumstances. Eventually, you go from not doing nothing to sparring full on against big, scary guys who are getting ready to fight in the UFC. Yeah, it's still scary, but at least you know what you need to do. You might not be able to do it, but you know what you need to do. So that ability to deal with stress and to say, okay, this is under my control, this is not under my control. And navigate between those two is something that we do all the time in martial arts training, especially if there's some kind of sparring in martial arts training. And the sort of stoicism and purposely putting ourselves in painful situations is a daily occurrence. So that really helped me keep the, the emotions under control going into this, make rational decisions before. Hmm, I should fill out a will. Hmm. I should figure out how my business is going to keep on going and give some money back to my kids if I die. Who's going to answer the emails? You know, questions like that before. What step, you know, and like I said, filming a whole bunch of stuff for grapple arts before because I knew I wasn't going to, I didn't know when I'd be getting back to the mats. Maybe it'd be six months. Maybe it'd be a year. I better have some stuff in the can before that point. And afterwards going, okay, this seems like a reasonable progression to do. As I said, I was a little bit ambitious and it cost me some time, you know, or it's a couple of UTIs between friends. 
but having that ability to judge where you're at physically and go, yeah, I feel like crap today. Maybe I should dial back a little bit. You know, I feel better than I did yesterday. I'll push it a little bit more. That ability to throttle on and off and make your training harder and easier depending on where you're feeling with the goal of ever increasing, that's something that we train all the time in martial arts and it applies to so many other things. I just did an AMA on Reddit. One of the people mentioned that when they're going through difficult stuff in life, they're thinking, you know, this is still a lot easier than being on the bottom of a cross choke than having somebody like try and rip my arm off with a Kimura. You know what it is? It, it's amazing how many non-jujitsu things jujitsu makes easier. So how am I now? What are the side effects of the medication? What are the side effects of having only one kidney and a smaller kidney than what I'm used to? And a transplanted kidney. If you take a kidney that's 100% function and you rip it out of him and you put it into me, it's probably not gonna have 100% function in me because it goes through some trauma. I right? so you take that kidney, bang it with a hammer a few times, stick it in me, it's gonna lose function. Moving it from one body to the other is the equivalent of banging it with a hammer a few times. And like I said, my brother is smaller than I am, so I wouldn't expect the same level of function. So I'm at about 40 to 45% kidney function now, which is pretty damn good. I uh, have to watch what I eat a little bit, like no grapefruit. I should steer clear of raw fish, should steer clear of raw eggs. I mostly do that, although I do like sushi once in a while. Um, in theory, because of the immunosuppressants, the anti-rejection drugs, I should get sick more often. The reality is probably I get sick less often. Now, whether that's because I'm pushing myself slightly less hard as I'm getting older, that could be it. It could also be that those kidneys were a continuous drain on my body, a drain on my system, a drain on my immune system, and thus, now that that's kind of better, it's more energy to fight the remaining bugs and viruses of everyday life. In general, I'm sick less often, and I also have other friends who've been doing jiu-jitsu, who I do jiu-jitsu with, who had kidney transplants like close to 30 years ago, who report the same thing. So if you're going in for a kidney transplant, there's a pretty good chance that life's gonna be pretty normal. I take a couple of drugs, nothing crazy, much lower levels than I used to. It's basically just to stop my body from attacking the kidney. Um, and I trust that by the time that kidney wears out, I mean, there are kidneys that are 30, 40 years in human bodies that are still doing all right. I trust that by the time that wears out, they'll be able to put the nano kidney, you know, manufactured in some warehouse somewhere into me. So I'm not that worried about it. My days of contact sports are over. I'm not gonna be sparring, sadly, any kind of boxing or kickboxing. I don't want that chance of trauma to my one good kidney, especially now that it's not as protected. Your kidneys are in back. So unless some asshole rabbit punches you in the back, you're probably okay. Mine's in the front, so I don't want to take that chance of getting hit there. So that's too bad, because I do believe that to be an effective martial artist, you do need to spar. But sparring involves danger, and in my case, with kickboxing sparring or boxing sparring, it's just not a risk I'm willing to take. I don't think the benefits are worth the risk. Thank God for jiu-jitsu, because I can still do jiu-jitsu. I do less throwing than I did because, again, if you get picked up and thrown or fall really badly, you can take a pretty heavy impact to the kidney. As a matter of fact, one of the times I bled uh, from my kidneys prior to my ever finding out about this, I was mountain biking, and I don't mountain bike very much, and I was mountain biking something way too steep, and I went over, and I saw this big rock, and I covered like this as I went over, and the good news is it protected me from the rock. The bad news is my hand that was down got driven up under my own ribs, basically essentially gave me a giant uppercut underneath my rib cage. And you know, a half hour later, I was, I was going into shock out there on the mountain bike trails. My kidneys, which were already susceptible to being ruptured. I didn't know that, but that's what happened. So yeah, unfortunately, contact in the sense of boxing, kickboxing is out. I still train a little bit of it on pads, knowing full well that my chances of applying it are much less than they would be if I was doing a proper system of, you know, boxing on pads and bags and then sparring, doing partner drills and all that. Yeah, you take the good with the bad. I'm glad to be alive. The thing is, I always tell this to people. A hundred years ago, I'm dead. A thousand years ago, 
I'm dead. A hundred thousand years ago, I'm dead. If I'm born in the hills of Pakistan, I'm dead. If I'm born in Angola today, I'm dead. There are so many ways that this could have turned out badly. If I just was randomly distributed anywhere in the world at any other time, the number of places and times where, I, where this has a happy ending, where I survive, it's very small. And that leads to a tremendous amount of gratitude for having the luck and good sense to be born in North America you know, in, the, in the 20th century and then having this problem in the 21st century. In the future, there might be a magical solution. That'll be great for the people then. This is a pretty good solution. I'm feeling pretty good now. Very, very glad to be alive and I can do most things. I mean, it's always hard to tell, right? I just went through this whole saga in 2015. In 2014, it started getting bad. 2015, it really went into the crapper, had the surgery. 2016, most of the surgeries were done. I started coming back out of it. Feeling pretty good. I've slowed down, but would I have slowed down just because I'm getting older anyway? It's so hard to tell, right? There's two things going on at the same time. There's me getting older, my injuries catching up with me. There's this whole kidney thing. Honestly, I think the kidney thing hasn't slowed me down. <laughs> Funny story. As I was going downhill there in 2014, 2015, a friend of mine told me, he goes, Steph, don't worry. There's a really, really high level rugby player, Jonah Lomu, and uh, he had some kind of kidney disease, and he had a kidney transplant, and he even got back to playing rugby. Not at an international level, but he got back to playing rugby at a pretty high level. I mean, he's dead now, but, but don't worry. If he had the transplant, you can have a transplant too. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> He got back to rugby and now he's dead. Awesome. Why am I recording this? There's a couple of reasons. Number one, if you're going through something difficult, whether it's a kidney transplant of your own, whether it's a lung transplant, whether you're fighting cancer, something like that, you gotta keep faith, you gotta keep hope, you gotta keep planning for the future and you gotta fight it every step of the way. Sometimes fighting means doing something as hard as you can and sometimes fighting means resting as hard as you can. And hopefully you know your body well enough to know when you can push and when you can back off. I found martial arts training to be incredibly useful in this regard. I found it sort of my touchstone. As I said multiple times, you're on the bottom of mount. You know what you have to do. It might not work, but you're still gonna try it. If you don't try it, for sure it's not gonna work. So you have to keep on trying it. You know, I hope that you have the strength to do the things you can, the serenity, to not do anything on the things that you can't change and the wisdom to know the difference between those two things. That's a really big deal. I've gotten back to doing the things that I thought I might never do again. Right, within six months of the operation, 50 kilometer hike in the mountains, one day. Later on this summer, hopefully a thousand miles solo in the Canadian Arctic, by myself in a canoe, traveling the old fur trade routes, traveling the old native migration routes up to Hudson Bay. Lord willing, the creek don't rise, that'll be coming soon. Hopefully I'll be documenting that as well. Those are things that seemed like as remote to me as visiting the surface of Mars back when I was dying, back when my kidney function was 12%. I was just a walking zombie that needed to lie down and have a nap a couple times a day, which is completely opposite from how I live my life. Keep the faith, keep on fighting to the end. Number two, I wanna encourage everyone to sign your bloody organ donor cards. Go and fill out whatever paperwork that you need to do in your state, in your country, to make sure that if you die, that your organs can be repurposed. I'm gonna give you one good reason to do it. I'm gonna give you one good incentive to do it. The good reason, I had a brother, Peter Johann Kesting. He died when he was 21. Motorcycle accident, middle of the night, country road, cerebral swelling hit his head, died. 24 hours later. This was devastating to me, but even worse for my parents who were there when they heard the impact of the car. They came running to his side. They heard him screaming. They saw the cops come. They saw the cops arrest him because he was so aggressive. They thought he was drunk. He wasn't drunk. It was a head injury. Head injuries make people aggressive. They saw him get put in the ambulance handcuffed. They saw him go off and he was dead when they saw him the next time. He never survived. He never came up again. He did not survive. They gave his organs away, the ones that could be used, to several different recipients. This helped my parents so much 
knowing that the death of their son resulted in the life of someone else's son. They actually ended up forming a relationship with one of the recipients. They went to his wedding. They met his kids. This was some salve, some balm in their time of difficulty. So if you sign that, if you go do the paperwork to be a donor yourself, if you die, you don't need the organs. But maybe your organs can help somebody else. And more selfishly for you, maybe they can help your family find meaning in your death. It'll be difficult, but it'll give some measure of meaning, some purpose, some consolation. I saw it with my parents. I felt it. And maybe your family will too. I don't know what the donation procedure is where you live. I don't know where you live. I don't know every single donation procedure in every single state, in every single country. Normally in North America, it's part of your driver's license. Go and sign that. It'll make you feel better about dying. It'll make your parents and your brothers and your sisters and your loved ones find some kind of meaning if you die prematurely. I hope you don't, but if you do, at least help somebody else as you go. Bribery. If you go, and sign up to be an organ donor. If you email me proof of the donation, whether that's a screenshot of the form that you fill out, a photo of your driver's license, email me at support at grapplearts.com. Support at grapplearts.com. Email me that and I'll give you an entire instructional that I normally sell for free. I will reserve the right that if people figure this out and I think I'm being scammed here by thousands of people in China or something, that I'll shut this down. But at least if you do it soon, I won't have shut it down yet, and you'll get something for helping somebody else. You get an entire instructional for free if you go do that. Also, if you've already been a donor, if you've given a kidney or bone marrow or part of your liver or part of your pancreas or some other part of your body, get in touch with me, give me some kind of proof, support at grapplearts.com, and I'll give you all of my instructionals. That's well over $1,000 worth of material because I totally respect you being a donor to help somebody else. Being a donor is tough, a living donor. Dead donors don't feel any pain. Living donors have to go through, you know, a physiological adjustment. My brother, it took him a few months to start feeling normal again because he pulled a kidney out. I went from 12% kidney function to 45% kidney function. I felt great. He went from 100% kidney function to 50% kidney function. That takes some adjusting. You can totally live on 50%. They wouldn't do it if it was a you know, increase the chances of dying. But it does take the wind out of your sails, for sure. Any surgery does. All right? Sign up to be a donor. Send me proof. Support at grapplearts.com. I'll give you something. Provide me proof that you've already been a donor, a living donor, and I'll give you a whole lot. All right, guys? Stay strong and good, you know, life is going to serve you up challenges, whether it's kidney failure or cancer or something else, life is going to serve up challenges. It's the training that you do before those challenges, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's martial arts, whether it's marathon running, whether it's rock climbing, whether it's meditation, anything that strains you past your comfort zone initially in small doses is going to help you make it through those big difficult times that are inevitable in everybody's life.